All right, so this is the third installment of our preaching on Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So today, if you'll turn, you don't have to turn, it'll be right on the screen here. I'm going to read for you. As I read, I want you to know, I'm going to show you um, four pictures, and I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell you four things. All right. Beginning in verse 9. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only ask us to be remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. But when Cephas came, or Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, and the result was that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature, not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves also have been found sinners... Is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I've once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. That's a beautiful text. I'd like to take you on a journey and show you four beautiful pictures. All right, so the first picture I want to show you is going to be three pillars. You'll see them on the, on the screen there. And I want to talk to you about those three pillars. Those three pillars, if you look at verse 9, and recognizing the grace that had been given to me by James and Peter and John, who are reputed to be pillars. I love that concept, don't you? That these three guys, these are heavyweights, just so you know. These are heavyweights in, in the New Testament. Peter and James and John. Now I want you to know that Peter, James, and John were the closest disciples to Christ. Not only they were the closest disciples to Christ, but they were reputed to be pillars in the church, in the early church. When the Holy Spirit comes down at the day of Pentecost, the church is established and birthed. And in the birthing of that, Peter takes his stand and preaches, and 5,000 people come to Christ. Peter, James, and John, these are the, the, the big guys. Now, when it comes to praying for Jairus' daughter, remember that. He's on his way to pray for Jairus' daughter. The, the woman with the issue of blood comes and interrupts it, the whole thing. Finally, they make it to the household, and he says, uh, Peter, James, John, come over here. Only the four of them, and plus the parents, were in the room when the, when the little girl was brought back from the dead. I want you to know Peter, James, and John witnessed the power of Christ, and he, he was, they were there and all the important things. I'd like to read for you one of those important times, uh, Matthew chapter 17. You don't have to turn there. You can just listen, but this is an incredible time. 
If I'm ever envious of the disciples, it's this text. If I ever say I would want to have been there, it's this text. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, pillars, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is good for us to be here, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, and they were terrified. I want to talk to you today about pillars, leaders in the church. I want to tell you four things about pillars. Number one, pillars bear weight. That's what pillars do. If you could imagine a, a Gothic temple or, or a temple, a building of some kind with like a courthouse, the pillars are there. The pillars bear weight. Leaders bear weight in the church. That's why God have, has called leaders to lead and to bear the weight of the church. Number two, I want you to know that those pillars are out front. The pillars are always out front. That's where leaders are. Leaders are out front. You can't lead from the back. You can't lead from the basement. You lead out front. Number three, I want you to know about leaders. It, uh, pillars as pillars <clears throat> serve the building. They serve the building. They don't serve themselves. They serve the building. And fourth and finally, here's what I want you to see about pillars and leaders is that they are flawed. Ah. I want you to know that no matter what church you go to, all the leaders are flawed. There's not one perfect leader that I've ever met in a church in my entire life, including this one. What pillars do, what leaders do in the church is leaders lead. They support the church. They're out front. They bear weight. And they're imperfect. So if you were to look at those pillars right there on the screen... You could see, if you look closely, all kinds of imperfections in, those, in that thing. There's scratches there. There are imperfections there. I want you to know that, and I'm telling you this for a reason, is that leaders lead and leaders bear weight and leaders are out front, but leaders are imperfect and they bear scars. The Apostle Paul who wrote this text bore scars. Peter. He's the leader. He's the guy. Man, if there's any guy, he's the guy. In the book of 2 Peter, you'll see he, he unfolds this whole thing about the, about the transfiguration. He says, I saw. I saw Christ transfigured. I saw the whole deal. How is it that a guy as strong as Peter can mess up here? I want you to know, Peter, the strength of the old New Testament church messed up because he is human and he is flawed. I say all that to say this to you, that Peter, James, and John, reputed to be pillars of the church, um, were human and they failed and they need prayers. I want you to look around this church, this local church. I want you to see the preaching team, the leaders, all the leaders that you know, and I want you to know every one of them needs prayer. There's not one of them that gets skate by. There's no perfect guys around here, no perfect girls around here. Trust me, I live with them. I'll tell you, nobody's perfect here, including this guy right here. What we need to do is be, um, it, it's easy to be critical of leadership, isn't it? It's easy to say, no, nah, I wouldn't have done it that way. <laughs> no, I'm calling you today to pray for leaders, to pray for those pillars. The second picture I want to show you is an interesting picture. You would recognize it right away as the faces of tragedy and comedy. Uh, and you would see this in, in acting and in actresses, and you would see this in the, in the theater. When you see this, <clears throat> you think of the theater automatically. Well, let me tell you where the word hypocrite comes from. The word hypocrite, which is basically directly what Paul called Peter. 
He says, Peter, you're a hypocrite. And the people from James, they're hypocrites. And by the way, your hypocrisy is so bad, it even sucked Barnabas in. Whoa. Barnabas is this great guy, man. Barnabas is, is he, he, he means son of encouragement. That's what his name means. Barnabas, son of encouragement. He's the encourager. He's the guy that's always above reproach. He's the guy that's always encouraging you and building you up in your most holy faith. The hypocrisy was so bad, you sucked even Barnabas into this deal. What hypocrisy comes from this, from the ancient um, acting world, and it means to wear a face of another. Uh-oh. I'm going to get you here. Put on a mask, wear the face of another. You're a hypocrite. You're acting like something you're not. That's what the word hypocrisy means. So Paul looks at Peter right in the, in the face and says, you're a hypocrite. Now, let me, so you don't feel bad, I want you to know a truth here. Every one of you are hypocrites. Every one of you. Watch my finger, and I'm a hypocrite. Let me tell you why. If you define hypocrisy as believing one thing and living another, None of us are yet perfect. Now, we are leaving our hypocrisy and moving toward the perfection of Christ. So I, now, people say sometimes, I don't go to church that they're full of hypocrites. And I say, you're right. Come join them. <laughs> Be a fellow hypocrite. On your way to maturing, on your way to looking like Jesus. I look at that picture, I'm thinking uh, tragedy and comedy, the theater, putting on a mask. You know, it's easy to put on a mask, isn't it? The easiest place to put on a mask is Sunday morning, just so you know. We all know that, right? How you doing, Martin? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. Fine. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> it is possible that Martin's cat just died. Or it's possible that Martin just had a flat tire. Yet, we have the misconception that when we come here, somehow we need to put on some masks. I would much rather see you just as you are. Pain, warts, and all than to wear masks. That was the trouble with Peter and his compadres. So you know the story. Here's what's happening. They're having a big dinner, right? And Peter's there, and James is there, and John is there, and Paul is there, and Barnabas is there. The whole crowds, all the gangs all gathered together for a big meal, and everybody's sitting down, and the, the main course is pork chops. <laughs> now, you know, if you're a Jew, you couldn't eat a pork chop. Couldn't do it. But when you came into Christ, you had the freedom now to eat pork or asparagus, anything you want. God says it's all good to eat. So here they are. Watch me now. They're all at the dining room table, right? They're all <laughs> laughing, having such a good time, eating that pork, wiping, the, wiping, you know, the grease from the pork all over their shirt, and all of a sudden, James's people walk in the door, and here's Peter. <laughs> no, not me. He goes over to the, to the vegetable table like he's been there the whole time. The problem is he's got a piece of pork chop hanging from his mustache. <laughs> That's hypocrisy. I love this text. I love the fact that these guys are so real, by the way. These disciples are so real that they, they butted heads every now and then. Have you ever considered the 12 disciples? Look at the 12 disciples, man. They are as diverse as the day is long. Right? You've got uh, Matthew the publican, also known as Levi. He sold out to the, to the Roman Empire, man. He was working for the Romans. He was, you know, he was a tax gatherer, taking a little cash on the side, a, a, a denarii for Caesar, a denarii for me, a denarii for Caesar, two denarii for me. He was a crook at his dog's hind leg. That's, that's who these guys were. They were tax collectors. And you have on the other end of the continuum, you have Simon the Zealot. Some of the zealots, the zealot party, they, were, they, were, they hated Romans. They killed Romans in guerrilla warfare every time they could get. They'd hide behind the pillars, come around with a, with a knife and <laughs> slit the throat of a Roman. You put those guys in the same room, sparks are going to fly. There's a misconception that just because we're all Christians, <laughs> oh, let's all get along. 
You rub shoulders long enough with other Christians and you don't always get along. In fact, sometimes God puts the right person in your path just to spark with you. Oh, gosh. The year must have been 1978, 1979, maybe 1980 even. We started this church, right? We're all young, young cats. We're all in our 20s, like 18 to 25. That's all the leadership. That's who we were. This sovereign move of God, God brought this church together, and the thing grew like nothing, like you couldn't even believe. It was over 1,000 people. And a bunch of kids were running it because that was the whole charismatic move. That's what God was doing in those days in the late 70s is this charismatic move happening, and, and, and Christians got saved all over the place. Now, here I am. I was not quite as refined then as I am now. <laughs> My wife likes to put it this way. Art, you got a chip on your shoulder. Anybody ever know what that means? You got a chip on your shoulder. So I walked around like I owned the place. Like I got it all together. Like I'm in large and in charge. Don't get in my way. I was young and idealistic, and I was take charging hell with a water pistol. I knew what I was doing. On the leadership team, there was another guy named Tom. Tom's father was Irish and his mother was Jewish. And Tom had flaming red hair and a temper to match. And he and I were like oil and vinegar, man. Tom Corrigan and me never saw eye to eye. Because both of us were very immature. Didn't really know how to lead properly. But we were called to lead. We were pillars. By golly. I'll tell you we're pillars. And man, every time we get together at staff meeting, sparks would fly. I can remember the day that we stood up chest to chest, just short of swinging blows. Doesn't that, that sounds so unchristian, doesn't it, to say like that? It just sounds like I'm not even saved or something. It's, it's like, is that guy even saved? I was saved. I was saved. But I was still young and impetuous and ready to throw down at the drop of a hat. That was the old art. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, make peace, man. Let's all get along, you know. <laughs> not so much in those days. We worked it out. A couple of years ago, Tom was in the city for something, and he called me. We had dinner together. It was such a wonderful, warm, special time. Sparks flew. We can't wear a mask. We can't be a hypocrite. We have to live Jesus out loud, out front all the time. Let's take a look at the next graphic. And I want to take it to a specific verse 16. It says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even though we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we have been, may be justified by faith in Christ and not the works of the law. The word justified is a legal term. It's a judicial term. And what does it mean? It means that, that the judge, you stand before the judge, and you're guilty of sin. And then you got to pay for your guilt. And somebody comes up and says, Judge, excuse me, Your Honor, I would like to pay for that man's guilt. And his name was Jesus. And he, he justified us, and he, he paid for our sins. And now, watch me now, the, the, the judge has the gavel in his hand, and he puts the gavel down on the wood and says, Justified by the blood of Jesus. And I want you to know today that text is very important. You're not justified by anything other than the blood of Jesus. You're not justified by a law. You're not justified by keeping a bunch of rules. You're not justified by uh, what, to, what denomination you attend. You're not justified by who your parents are. You're not justified by who your mentor in the faith is. You're justified only by one thing, and that one thing is Jesus Christ and him crucified and his shed blood upon the cross. That's all there is to it. I love when I look at that gavel. I hear the judge say, not guilty. Not guilty? Do you know what I did? 
not guilty. Hmm. Justification is an incredible word. We have, we have the Reformation with Martin Luther in 1575 because of one thing, justification. By faith, by faith alone. Not by law, not by rules, not by papal edict, but by faith of faith alone. I want you to know no amount of works can help you. It's only Jesus that can help you being justified before the throne of God. The last picture I want to show you is uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, For I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It's one of my favorite Pauline verses, by the way. Paul says, look at me now. Here's what Paul is saying. Look at me. I, it's, it's not me that's living. It's Christ that's living in me because I'm crucified. Now, that word crucified is a cruel, cruel term. It's a cruel, cruel word. I'm going to ask something. Can I have your attention? I'm going to ask something. When the word is being preached, I need your focused attention right here. It's not about me. It's about the word of God being preached. When you walk into this house, you honor the Lord by listening to the word. Not chit-chatting, not playing on phones, but you listen to the word. The apostle Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. So here's what I'm going to say to every one of you today in the room, that you need to go to the cross. Not the cross of Christ. That's been done once. Never to be repeated ever again. Ha! Ah, once and once only. You come with the cross you come to is your cross. The, the, uh, Jesus says it this way. You should bear your cross daily. Every day you have a cross to climb up on. And that cross is the place where you die. The Apostle Paul says it this way. I'm, I'm dead. The old man has gone away. The old, the old flesh is dying. And what's come is the resurrection of life. Ha. Now, Jesus gets a chance to live in you every day. This is called incarnational truth, by the way. You, get, you know what the word incarnation means? It's a simple theological term that means that Christ comes, God in the flesh. And that's who you are today. God in the flesh. You go to work. God goes to work. You go to the shop right, God's just watch the shop right. If we begin to see ourselves in this way, I represent God. Not only do I represent God, God is in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. These are all words that Paul has said along the way. Let me tell you four things that I'm done. Number one, I'm going to give you a statement of fact. Here's the statement of fact. Leaders are called to lead, but they're not perfect, and they need your prayers. Number two, a caution. The caution is this. Don't fall into hypocrisy. It happens just that easy. Number three, a truth. The truth is this, that you're justified by Christ in Christ alone. Number four, crucifixion is a way of life. Every day, it's a way of life. Every day, you climb back on the cross. Say, Lord, here I am to submit my flesh to you. I pray you kill my flesh so my spirit might live. Don't you love Galatians 2? Don't you love all the dynamic of this text the human stuff that goes on here, the, 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 the uh, transparency of the early apostles as they understood, as they were beginning to understand who they were, as they grew in the faith, as they grew in the kingdom of God. And that's you and I. Nobody is there instantly. Nobody gets saved and instantly is there. You're not mature. You're not grown up. You don't look like Jesus just yet. You're on your way. It's a journey. Sometimes we're driving along 
and something um, less than ideal happens in the car. My first reaction oftentimes, quite honestly, is to complain. And this is what Pastor Chernoy says. Art, let's just enjoy the journey. It makes me so mad sometimes when she says that, you know, because I want to be mad about something. Oh. <laughs> Look, uh, look, the road is closed. It's going to cost us an hour because of the road construction. Art, let's just enjoy the journey. (laughs) And every time she's right, she's right, she's right, she's right. We're called to enjoy the journey. Focus upon the things of the kingdom of God. So I'm going to pray with you right now. I'm going to pray you through those four things, okay? Let's pray together. Well, Lord, we want to pray. And thank you that, first of all, you are a God who gives us human leadership. We thank you for the Peter, the James, the Johns, the Barnabases among us, the pastors, the preachers, the elders, the council members, all those who lead us. Lord, I thank you for the gift that they are to this congregation. And then, Lord, I pray you would, we pray for them. Would you remind us, Lord, that they need prayer, that they struggle like others struggle? I thank you for those pillars, the picture of the pillars. I pray, Lord, that that would be deeply embedded in our mind. And then, Lord, I pray that we would uh, take the caution of not being hypocrites, not wearing masks, but just being who we are, a man formed by God, a woman formed by God on the journey, on the way. Then, Lord, I pray for understanding in our spirit man They were justified by you and you alone. Nothing we can do. We can't earn salvation. We can't earn uh, favor with God. (laughs) We, We just live it. We live out what you've already given to us because of Jesus, what you've done for us on the cross. And finally, Lord, I pray, we live with ourselves. We know our stuff. And we know what needs to be nailed to the cross. We know what needs to be crucified so that Christ can live in us. So, Lord, today we want to intentionally make the journey to the cross nail ourselves up there, and say this, the old man is dying and the new man is raising the resurrection of life. So I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the text today. Lord, I pray we'll just find a a deep place to be buried in our heart and it will be good soil. It will bear 100-fold in Jesus' name. Amen.